Welcome back to another episode of the Six Figure Creative Podcast. I am your host, Brian Hood. And if this is your first time listening, welcome to the Six Figure Creative Podcast. We talk all about how to earn more as a creative without selling your soul and without doing something you don't necessarily love to do. We're here to inspire you to bring you new ideas from outside sources that you may have never had been exposed to. And that's actually kind of the theme of the episode today. So before we actually get into the topic, I've got my co-host for the day, Mark Eckert. Say hey to everybody. What's up, everybody? How's it going? Glad to have you back here, my dude. I'm always thankful when you when you show up here today. And I, I wanted to ask you something before we even get into the episode. You recently had a, a kerfuffle. <laughs> That's a good word. Oh, yeah. I called you up crying, basically. <laughs> <laughs> you, you literally called me up, not crying, but you were like, let me just back up really quick. Mark has multiple businesses. We'll, we'll probably talk about some of those today because they're relevant to what we're going to talk about today as creatives and, and inspiring you to grow a bigger, better business. We had at least one shortcoming with that, and that is your major source of client acquisition or customer acquisition was tied to a single source. You had a single point of failure and that single point of failure failed on you. Talk about what it was that happened when you called me that I had to talk you off the ledge. Just briefly go over that because this is relevant to people that are doing what you're trying to do. Yeah. So uh, I'm a producer. Music producer. Yep. Music producer. I have a bunch of businesses that help producers and artists and music licensing companies and all that stuff. So I have a Facebook ads account where we run all of our Instagram ads And I ran an ad for one of my businesses, thatpitch.com. I ran it to our customers and it was for a referral system. And it just said, hey, you can sign up for this. If you do this, I'll pay you $30. But I worded it as get paid $30, just hook up your friends. And Facebook, (laughs) I literally like pressed publish and just my face was paused. Whole thing refreshed. I was blocked out. Facebook thought I was soliciting sex. Because I said, get paid and hook up friends. So I thought I was paying people to hook up. And yeah, I got completely kicked off overnight. I lost probably about 80% of our daily traffic. It wasn't a complete single point of failure, but it was like a three-legged stool and one leg (laughs) just got knocked out from it. No, I'd I'd say one and a half legs. So I was kind of just diagonal. It wasn't great, man. Like it was, it was a mess. So yeah, I called you up. That was like a month or more ago. And just fast forwarding through it, like you just got your account back like this week. (laughs) Yeah, literally a couple days ago. And uh, I'm like on cloud nine, baby. (laughs) Yeah. But in the meantime, this is, and this was the advice I gave you, which is good for listeners to hear just in the future as our audience grows, becomes more successful, expands what they're doing with their businesses and starts digging into paid advertising. My advice to you was while this is down and you're figuring out, go learn a new ads platform. And you did, you learned Google ads and and YouTube ads. So I started running YouTube ads and also we built out this really badass content engine. So we post reels every single day, started a podcast, built out like a new email funnel and all this stuff. And like, Again, I feel like a huge weight was lifted off my shoulder. It's actually, it's actually interesting. So like, I forget the name of the concept, but like basically when we are restrained by something, like we have restraints, borders around us, it forces us into new areas we wouldn't otherwise think about because like you were reliant on Facebook ads. It was doing the job of sending as much traffic and leads and clients and customers to your businesses as you needed. And once that was removed from you, you actually built a better, healthier business. So it was like that dependency removed, you have a better business now. Yeah. Creativity spawns from constraints always. For my career, all innovation was from a problem. Like if you look the history of the world, all the huge innovations that happened were during war. Big things happen when you're under a lot of stress and have to figure stuff out. If you are backed into a corner, you figure it out. You'd be surprised what you're made of. Let's jump forward into the topic for today's uh, discussion. Because when we were outlining this, we talked for way too long. We, we started talking an hour and a half ago. We were just talking about so much stuff. And, and outlining this episode took forever because we just kept going off on tangents about like things we're excited about or talking about or wondering about or, or whatever. So I'm excited for this episode today. This episode kind of spurred, the idea spurred why I was going through some comment threads about things and just seeing people's reactions to something that doesn't seem relevant to them. So I'm hoping I was smart enough to write a good enough hook for this episode and title for this episode and description for this episode where you thought it was relevant enough for you and you didn't have the response. Oh, this isn't relevant to me. This isn't going to help my business. I'm too much of a snowflake for this to apply to me. I'm hoping that wasn't the response. And if you are listening, in fact, you aren't that person. So that's great, which sucks because I think the person who most needs this episode is the person who would never listen to this episode because there's nothing I can do to hook that person in. So maybe I'll just say, listen to this episode and I'll give you a million dollars in cash guaranteed. I won't. It's a lie, but I'm just saying, maybe I have to say that. Anyways, this podcast was rebranded from something called the Six Figure Home Studio Podcast, which was all a podcast about recording studios and home recording studios and music production. 
to the six figure creative, probably like 70 episodes ago. And a huge chunk of people stayed on from that audience and continue to listen week to week, which I love you if you were that person and continue to be inspired by all these amazing guests that we have come on the show. And the entire thought process behind that rebrand was I get so much inspiration from other people on the outside of the music industry that I need to talk to those people more. And so this, we rebranded, we've got to talk to so many amazing guests already. And this is just the beginning of the six figure creative podcast. We've only had 60, 70 episodes of this podcast since we rebranded. But I saw some conversations happening in a, in a thread where people were saying, Oh, I just haven't really listened since the rebrand. It's not relevant to me anymore. And I, I hate to see that. And I know that person's not listening or those people are not listening to this episode right now, but I just want to say for anyone that's new, that's giving this episode a chance or may not really have any understanding that like you can learn from people outside of the industry, but this gut response that I am a special snowflake and that this episode or this topic is not relevant for me because they're in a completely different industry is the antithesis of why this podcast exists. This podcast exists to bring together all these amazing outside ideas from creatives and not creatives to help you in your creative business. When we were outlining this episode, you said a quote that I freaking love, dude. And I'm just going to say it here. This is a quote by Mark Eckert, my wonderful co-host for the day. He says, if you're studying anything that's already been done, you're already late. We're all like, copying something somewhere. Like in both of our businesses, Mark, we've kind of like taken inspiration from all these different areas, but almost none of that inspiration is from businesses in our industry. Like, would you ever study what your competitor down the road is doing (laughs) as making a decision? I look at my entire life as I don't have a competitor at all. Actually, my competition is my prospect not doing anything. That's my biggest competitor. Yeah. Yeah. When you're first coming up, As a creative, you mostly learn some sort of creative skill. You got a a camera and you're like, I love photography. Or you got an interface in a DAW, a DAW. And you said, I want to learn music production. Or you got a video camera and you're like, I want to be a filmmaker or something. Like you, you had that inspiration when you came in. And so you start to look to how to master that craft. And so you're surrounded by people who are amazing at that craft. But there comes a time when you said in your head, I want to make this a business. You either said it automatically, like you knew this ahead of time, or it just happened to you. Somebody asked you for money to do the thing that you're offering. What happens though, is you stay in that mindset of, I'm going to learn from all the other people in this creative field, all the other videographers in my area. I'm going to look at their pricing, their website, how they do their things. This is something that I'm going to call an inbred business. This is where the genetic pool is not diverse enough to have a healthy, happy business. And I'm sorry for, (laughs) I'm from Alabama. I can talk about this, right? Like, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I can say this. This is where it's like the genetic pull of like your outside influences just aren't healthy. Like it's, you have an inbred business. If all you're looking to is other people in your exact industry to mimic things after. And I, I see this so much in my background, which is music production in the audio world. Audio people are the worst of this. I'm sorry if I'm throwing so many people listening to this under the bus. You look to your competitor down the street and you launch a website just like them. I'm going to put my gear list on my website as if my clients give a shit about that. I'm going to put <laughs> photos of me next to my gear and, and my whole rack of gear. I'm going to put all my rates on my website because everyone else does. And then I'm going to charge the same $200 a song or $80 a song or whatever as everyone else. And then I'm going to wonder why no one's coming to me because you're a commodity. You're an inbred business and no one wants that. So this episode is kind of like just one of those reminders. And we've got a lot more content than just like us shaking our finger at you today. But like, we've got some stuff we want to talk about a case study, an example of someone bringing in a million a year because I took outside inspiration. Like maybe I should have led with that. (laughs) Maybe that's a better hook than whatever I use at the beginning of this. Just note, like the healthiest businesses I've ever seen have a vast DNA pool. (laughs) They are the beautiful non inbred businesses out there. And I, and I want to talk about one today. But I, I've been talking about so much. Do you have anything to add to what I've said so far, Mark? Yeah. I mean, if you look at like the most badass businesses in the world that always stand the test of time, they're the best at taking inspiration from everybody that's not in their business. This could be creative. I mean, it could even be in like real estate or like anything. I mean, there's there's countless stories. But yeah, you need to be studying everybody else because nobody around you is actually creative. You're just going to be copying them. <laughs> yeah. Which is funny because like as creatives, we should be the ones to look for outside sources of inspiration. Like, can you imagine the painter who only has been inside of a black box his entire life? What are his paintings going to look like? He has no outside inspiration. Like, so as creatives, like we crave that outside inspiration when we're creating art, right? We listen to other genres of music. If we're a producer, we look at films and we look at commercials and we look at things if we're doing video, like we get all this outside inspiration for our art. 
But when it comes to businesses, we are the most creatively stagnant inbred people there are. And it just goes against everything that I believe is creative. So you, you said another thing, another quote I'll, I'll attribute to you, Mark. If you are an inbred business, the best you can ever hope to be is number two. Like that's the best you can be because you're just copying number one and everything number one does. So the best you will be is a watered down copy of that. And you can maybe be a worse version, number two. Like I don't want to be that. I want to be the best at what I do. And it, it takes outside inspiration to do that. So I want to move into, uh, you can call this a case study, a, a really good example of somebody who's looked to outside inspiration and created a wildly successful seven figure business as a single person. It's a freelancer called Design Joy. So if you're watching on YouTube right now, I've, I've actually pulled up their website. I'm going to kind of go along with this. But if you look at Design Joy's website, he has taken a ton of inspiration from the startup community, specifically like the SaaS community, software as a service. And he's turned his entire business model on its head because the way he does things, I'm just kind of scrolling around, is he has, this looks like a software company. If you're looking at the screen share right now, he has literally pricing plans where he has monthly payment, quarterly payment, yearly payment. He has three different plans to choose from. And it's in a recurring service. And he charges really high rates. If you're looking on YouTube right now or watching the video of this, it's very high rates, like higher than most designers, but it's a flat monthly fee for unlimited design. He has taken this business model from the software as a service community, which for those who don't know what that is, to me, it's one of the best industries to take business advice from because they have quantified so much of what a service-based business does. And then they are obviously replicating it with software. So like the business model is actually nearly the same if you can make it work as someone like the freelancer, but they have just turned us on his head. And that's how you've built these billion dollar unicorns because they've, they've got such great business models. So I, I know you, Mark, you kind of did the same thing. Whenever you were in full-time music production, you looked to the outside sources of this, like these companies doing recurring revenue and you did the same thing in music. And you were the, you actually, the first time you were on the show back on episode 68, which was in 2019, like beginning of 2019, you were on the show because you had built a recurring revenue business as a music producer, which is way outside the norm. So talk about that transition and where you got inspiration for that. Yeah. So just like most freelancers, you know, you get a client and they pay you a flat rate, then you do that work. And then you might hear from them like a year or two later when I was just producing full-time independent artists, that's kind of what they're used to. In fact, a lot of times they're used to paying half up front and then the work gets done. And then the producer says, Hey, when you pay me, you can, you can have the finished everything, you know, everything's going to be done for you. And I was like, I just want consistent revenue. <laughs> I just want to make sure my rent's cool. <laughs> Every freelancer knows the feast or famine cycle that most freelancers go through at least once in their life. I remember like one month I made 20 grand into January and then February I made $1,200. <laughs> yeah, that's like really common. So I decided like, okay, how much do I charge for a song? At the time I charged, I think it was 1200 a song. And it took me, I think on average about, five days to complete it with revisions and everything. So what I did is I divided that by five, 1200 divided by five. What is that? Like 200 something dollars or whatever. And I just made it a point where I'm going to give them six days. It's going to be better. And I'm just going to charge a monthly rate over three months. So it was $400 a month. The production was going to be completed at month three. We had stages of production. And they got more time. It was a better product and we could like release the track and then they could just stay. So we got the track done month one, month two. And then by month three, we were promoting it. And month four, which started like the new three month period, we started another song. Every quarter they're putting out a new single, which is like the better business model for clients as well. So it was, it was a win-win. My whole strategy was basically marketing. Like in today's day on Spotify, you have to put out an album. People listen to singles. You get on a playlist. So you should just be consistently putting out singles. So let's make a plan that works for you that can put out singles and you don't have to save up a huge chunk of cash. It's just, Hey, I'm a bill. I'm just like a really expensive electric bill. <laughs> you, know, you know where my mind goes when you say that? I'm just a bill sitting on Capitol Hill. That's right, dude. That was me. Yeah, that was, that was great. And I completely got that from subscription models. And then every single business I currently have is a subscription model that replaced something that was not a subscription model. Was that after you read the book, Automatic Customer? I never even read Automatic Customer, which is hilarious. I had a bunch of friends send it over, but then I started like picking it up and I was like, this is what I'm already doing. So, 
And so like, okay, going back to design joy, like he has automatic customers. If someone signs up on a monthly or quarterly or yearly plan with him, he has that customer until they cancel. So he doesn't have to go out and constantly get customers. So it's, it's wonderful if you take the SaaS philosophy, software as a service philosophy of the recurring revenue customers and bring it to the freelance world. And not every business model can make that happen. Honestly, if you're a, if you're a wedding photographer, this is probably not the business model for you, but there are plenty of other industries to learn from. You know what my favorite business book is? I know you already know this because I said it to you before we actually did this show, yep. but pretend like you don't yep. know, Mark. Do you know what my favorite business book is from the past two years? What is it, Bri? <laughs> you don't have to say it like that, but it's fine. What is it? <laughs> <laughs> it's a book called Gym Launch Secrets. And it has nothing to do with a creative business. I have no plans to launch a gym, but it is one of the best business books I've read in the last two years. It is incredible. I've recommended it to so many people. And this is the, the perfect example of what I'm talking about. When I look to outside industries for inspiration on what I'm going to do in my business or my businesses in my case, I love seeing these other things. Like Alex Ramosi in that book has built an incredible business model for the gym industry. He turned that into a seven, eight, nine figure coaching business. And then he turned that into a massive portfolio empire that he's now at a hundred million a year or something ridiculous. So like, I would love to learn from those people as a creative because I'm a creative entrepreneur. There's so much to be gained from these outside sources. And instead of saying, Jim Launch Secrets, I'm not going to read that book. I don't want to launch a gym. I said, you know what? I like Alex's other book, hundred million dollar offers. I really love that book. He only has one other book out right now. I'm just going to read that too, <laughs> because I love the author. And I'm like, it was way better than $100 million offers, in my opinion. So a really cool example, I'm just going to bring up another book, but then I'm going to state an example that was stated in that book that completely resonates with this whole topic. So there's a book called Blue Ocean Strategy, and it's one of my favorite books of all time. I've approached basically my entire career with Blue Ocean Strategy. That might be the most referenced book that I constantly talk about that I've never read. <laughs> I just love the idea of the blue ocean strategy. Sum up the blue ocean strategy really quick for anyone not listening right now. So here's the idea of the blue ocean strategy. If you're near the shore, right, there's a bunch of fish, there's more sharks, they're all fighting over the same food. It's the red ocean. You know, people are, or not people, <laughs> fish are all fighting over the <laughs> same food. Depends on where you're at. Maybe Australians where they have shark attacks. Right, right. But if you go way out, it's desolate. There's like barely any fish like way out there. There's nothing out there. But you're the only thing. So there's not as much activity, but if you're there, you're going to land it. Like it's all yours. And I'll actually say in our world, in the creative world, sometimes it's not a blue ocean. It's just a blue pond. It's a small little niche that's not being served. There's nothing in it. We have it to ourselves and we can set up shop there without any competition. So sometimes it doesn't have to be some massive ocean. When I was only producing full time, firstly, I was the producer for indie pop artists. I didn't work with any other artists. I only focused on this one. I used to reference your headline on your website so often. It was literally just said, all I give a f about is producing indie pop. Producing indie pop artists. I had it down to a science. I was really fucking good at this like one thing. It's all I listened to is so easy for me. But then I went even deeper. I kind of realized that the majority of people who really want to hire a producer are ones that are not in huge music scenes. You know, I was kind of like just researching and I was like, wow, the majority of people making this style of music don't live in LA, New York or Nashville or London. They're actually all over the world. So anytime I would post something back in the day, like I would do geolocations and they run like random cities and stuff. But I also, when I would run ads, I basically had every English speaking country, but I excluded major music cities because I'm in Charlotte, North Carolina. I'm the guy who understands your music scene. I'm independent. You're independent. You make this kind of music. I specialize in that. And I only do that. That took me very far. But a really cool example from Blue Ocean Strategy, there's a wine company called Yellowtail Wines. If you're in the US, any grocery store you go to with the kangaroo on it, that's Yellowtail Wines. And it's a massive section. Well, they were the Australian wine company. And at the time, there was no famous Australian wine. At the time, it was California, France, Italy, all the super, super fancy stuff. And the team at Yellowtail Wines were like, we're never going to be able to compete with this super sommelier, fancy, fancy wine brands. And so they realized a lot of people liked the taste of wine but they felt so intimidated shopping for it. They felt so scared ordering it because they thought people were condescending to them. 
or they would say it wrong because wines choose the most pretentious French words possible. Right. <laughs> so Yellowtail was like, okay, we're going to be the wine company for beer drinkers. We're going to be the wine company for soda drinkers. And within a couple of years, they dominated the market. And it's because they were just looking at people that weren't being served and they just studied what was being done in other markets. And they just did very well for themselves. <laughs> yeah. And that's kind of the whole point of this episode. I mean, this may not be a long episode, which is fine, but if it changes one mind out there that like outside inspiration is the way of growth and being an inbred business is the way of death. It's stagnation. It's unhealth. That's all I want is to, to get that message across. And this is kind of for our, our entrepreneurial listeners. Like it's like a spectrum. Like there's the creative side of us and then there's the entrepreneurial side of us. If you're listening to this podcast, you likely have some entrepreneurial side. For some people, that's the dominant side. Like for me, I'm actually more entrepreneur than I am creative. I learned this over time, but the creativity was actually a means to be entrepreneurial. I couldn't create a product. I didn't know how to launch a real business, but I knew how to, to offer a service. And over time, as I've had all these new ideas from outside sources and other industries that have influenced me, I've been able to launch bigger and better business models. I have two software companies. It is a way better business model than freelancing. I will straight up say that as someone who has an audience that's almost all freelancers, it should sound sacrilegious, but it's a better business model. The only way you're ever going to get to that point, if you want to graduate from freelance, as I call it, and build some bigger, better business model, especially one that allows you to travel to Bali on a one-way ticket in a couple of weeks where I have no return date planned. I'm just going to be gone for the fall. You can't do that if you're an inbred business. That's, I just love it. That's the term we've landed on. Brian, I'm also like not kissing ass here, but I want to push back on you saying that you're more like business than creative. At this point in my life, I actually don't even think it's a spectrum. I think it's all the same thing. I think people just have the wrong idea of business versus creativity. Andy Warhol, forget everybody listening to this podcast. Andy Warhol is more important than all of us in the art world. Okay. So if you can't get behind what Andy said, then you're a poser. He said, being good in business is the most fascinating kind of art. And he also said, I sent this quote to my buddy earlier today because he was dealing with the same exact thing. Making money is art and working is art and good business is the best art. So maybe it's not a spectrum for me. Maybe I am creative and I've just moved my creativity over to the entrepreneurial side. I think you're honestly one of the most creative dudes I know. This is just the avenue that you're putting a lot of your energy in. It just so happens to include transactions, but you're extremely creative. I honestly think if people, all they're doing is just making art, and they don't have a means of monetizing it, well, what happens? You end up not doing it as often because you have to pay your rent. And what's going to happen? You get stuck in a shitty nine to five, and that's going to be your life, your whole life. Do you really think that you're going to be more of a true artist than somebody who's doing it full time? No, you're insane if you think that. So honestly, I think the most talented, most hardworking, most skillful artists there are so happen to be in business for themselves and they're damn good at it. Yep. So if you're listening to this podcast and you're like, okay, what do I do now? Go be inspired by other books. Go look through our backlog of episodes. Even the episodes from 150 and before when we were the six figure home studio and we were talking predominantly to music producers and home studios, there's tons of great content in those episodes that is directly applicable to any creative freelancer out there. And frankly, many other business types as well, but don't fall into the trap that I see so many people falling into. And I'm wagging my finger at some of our list, maybe not listeners now, but definitely past listeners who stopped listening when we transitioned. Stop being the person that looks at something and says, oh, that's not for me. It's the same type of person that says, ah, oh, I can't do that. Instead of how can I do that? I think that's a difference between the unsuccessful say, I can't do that. I could never do that. And the successful just say, I can't do it yet, but I would love to. What can I do to get that done? Or how can I accomplish that thing? And here's another thing is if you're only studying in your industry, realistically, you're only going to get so far into truly learning how something is working because the majority of the people that you would learn from have a vested interest in you not being as good because they're going to look at you as a competitor, unfortunately, because so many people in the creative industry think there isn't much money to go around when in fact there is a lot of money to go around. But if you learn from other industries, like if you meet somebody who owns a restaurant and it's just awesome, like it's amazing food, they're packed. You can tell they're doing really, really well. You talk to the owner of that. Oh my God, they're going to tell you everything they do. They're going to tell you their profit margins, how they've you know made sure that the environment's great for everybody. Well, if you're 
let's say an artist and you have a Facebook community, you can learn from that. Okay. How did this person make sure everyone was comfortable? Like, how did they do the seating arrangement? How did they make sure everybody was taken care of? Can I bring that into my Facebook community? Okay. Well, maybe what I can do is I can make little groups within it where people talk to each other and it's like almost sitting at a table. That's just one example, but like, there's so many ways that you can take somebody else's insight that has nothing to do with your industry and bring it back to your own. Here's the other thing as well. Cause like sometimes there are no specific takeaways. Sometimes it is merely inspirational. And I'll tell a quick story of like, this is actually what sparked my entrepreneur flame. Everyone has that moment where like something finally sparks inside of them. where like, Oh, I see the bigger picture now as an entrepreneur. Everyone has a different story around that, but mine was involved playing around in golf. For those who don't know, I'm a closet golfer. Like I play golf. It's really embarrassing. Stop talking about it, Brian. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like I, I've got my, my handicap down to like a six, which if you are a golfer, you know, that's not, that's not bad. I can putt putt with the best of them, baby. <laughs> so like I was playing golf one day and it was just a, it's a walk on course. It's just right down the road from my house here. So meaning you don't have to have like a, a tee time or anything. You just walk on the golf course. And so when you do that, you end up just meeting up with random people so that you can kind of group up and play together. And I played golf with this guy one day and we were just talking, it was just me and him. And we were talking and walking and you always talk about business or whatever. And he had told me that he was up in Nashville scouting a new location for his restaurant. And I was like, interesting. So I'm asking a bunch of questions about it. And long story short, I won't name his business because it's still around and it's still doing great. But he, he had told me everything about the business, the business model, how much they were making. They were like profiting like 30 grand per week. He had systemized the entire restaurant and hired a manager out and everything and had cameras like watching over employees and stuff. And he was able to do this without working at all. He had completely systemized the process where he was simply the business owner. And that was the first time I'd ever heard of anyone doing that or met somebody who had really done that. I'd heard of it before, but never met someone doing it. And there wasn't anything as a music producer, there was nothing that I could really directly take away from that and say, I'm going to apply that in my business. I did systemize some things. So there maybe was a little bit there more than anything else. It was inspiration from that story of this guy up in Nashville, just playing golf, we ended up playing 18 holes together. So it took like four hours. We were just walking and talking. It changed my trajectory because that was like 2014. That was the first six figure year I had. That was the first year I really started taking my business seriously. That was the first year I started listening to podcasts. I started binging podcasts. I just typed in business podcasts into all the podcast feeds. That was the start of my entrepreneur journey. And so like anyone listening right now, maybe this is your start of your entrepreneur journey where you're realizing that there is creativity in being a business owner. There is creativity in entrepreneurism, but it takes the outside perspective from all the successful other industries brought back into your industry so that you're not an inbred business owner, <laughs> which sounds harsh <laughs> if you haven't listened to this, the rest of this episode. But again, we need that diversity in our DNA of our business in order to make this work. 